Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Ready to get back in our Father's Word? You can rest assured we are. Most asked questions. We dealt with in the last lecture questions concerning teaching my people to fly to save their souls. Why would God be against that? Well, uh, we're going to, in, in a second segment, we're going to get to that. But first, what should you know other than what is written in God's Word concerning the second advent? You see, both First and Second Thessalonians have to do with the, the subject is the coming of the Lord at the second advent. So that's why you want to be very familiar with um, these two books written by Paul to that particular group. There's a great deal of information entailed therein. So let's, let's pick up what should you know aside from God's word concerning that return that second advent. We're going to pick that up in the second, um, 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter, and verse 1. Let's read along here a little bit and see what the Father tells us concerning the seasons. So a word of wisdom from our Father in Yeshua's name, chapter 5, verse 1, 1 Thessalonians, and it reads, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you, why? Because it's already been told over and over, the generation of the fig tree, that um, the uh, false Messiah comes in the night. The true Lord comes in the night. When people are, un a figure of speech that means when most people, the unlearned, are not expecting it. Verse 2, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Um, and, uh, and so it is. You know that, but you see, in the book of Daniel, in the teachings of Mark, Matthew, and Luke, you are given the season, absolute, with no questions asked, the parable of the fig tree, in other words. That's why Jesus didn't say, maybe you should learn it. He said, learn it. Now, verse 3. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman. Those labor pains get closer and closer together with child, and they shall not escape. If, if you are not familiar with the birth of a new age, now's the time to get acquainted with it. Now is the time not to be deceived. Now is the time to know that, um, he says, I don't, I don't even have to write. Why? It's already written in God's Word over and over. And he continues, verse 4, But ye, brethren, are not in darkness. Why? You're in the light. Light what? Christ is the light. That that day should overtake you as a thief. It's, you're not going to be surprised. You know the combination of events that must take place before Christ returns. You know that first the false Christ must come. There is no way that Christ will return to this earth without the false Christ coming first. Jesus taught it in Mark 13 when he said, not maybe that the false Christ would come, but the false Christ as well as false prophets would come before Christ would return to this earth, so it shouldn't surprise anyone. As a matter of fact, we know from Revelation chapter 12, verse 7, that Satan, along with his fallen angels, are kicked out on this earth. And uh, you can get set for it. It's going to happen. Verse 5, Ye are the children of light, and the children of the day. Ye are not of the night, nor of darkness. So therefore, as children of light, do you remember the, symbolically 
Back in old times, when Joshua was in a terrible battle, God lengthened the day so that they had the victory. Well, Christ being our light and we're never in the darkness, the day is lengthened until we have the victory. We're going to win. So uh, never be uptight about when the end shall be. Why? Well, chronologically, you know the events that must transpire to bring that day to pass. Let's check it out. What's got that? What, are, what is one of the major things that must happen first? You're not going to have it, but as you're turning to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, I'm going to read the seventh verse of chapter 1. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. If you're troubled and anxious about Christ's return, rest. Who is, what is rest? Sabbath. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, when he returns, when he comes back, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord's day is not going to be light on those that um, disbelieve or that enjoy the way of the world, that enjoy uh, uh, using people. Uh, God does not appreciate that. So then if Christ in Mark 13 and Matthew 24 and Luke 21 assures us that the false Christ is coming first and God's elect are going to be delivered up, then you've got to be prepared mentally for that. As, as you're turning to 2 Thessalonians, I'm going to go to um, the great book of John, uh, the epistle of John, and I'm going to read a little something and then we'll pick up in chapter 2. John, the, the apostle of love, wrote in the uh, second chapter of the first epistle of John, little children, it is the last time. And as you have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists whereby you know that it is the last time. You know they're here. Anti means instead of Christ are ministers that claim to be Christian ministers that never quite get around to teaching God's word chapter by chapter and verse by verse to forearm or warn people. 19, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that, they might be made man that it might be made manifest that they were not of us. You know, uh, he says there are many antichrists around, but the, the antichrist shall come. Now, um, that's got to happen. Well, where, where would Paul have mentioned this? That was John, okay? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Absolutely some of the most, the simplistic writings of Paul. He writes, you know, a lot of people got confused by those verses we covered in 1 Thessalonians yesterday in the last lecture. They really did. They don't understand that trump in the sky and people, you know, the change of bodies into the spiritual, that's to say meeting in the spiritual body, the air, um, the breath of life. They just don't quite get that. Well, so Paul wrote a second letter to the Thessalonians. We're going to take our time going through it. Chapter 2, 2 Thessalonians, verse 1. Now we beseech you, and we want to talk very serious to you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto Him. Now that's the subject. What is the subject? Christ return, and how is it we're going to get back together with Him? Are we going to meet off out here in space on Jupiter or Saturn, Satan's little planet, which Saturday is named after? Well, I don't know. He's going to tell us. Do you believe the Word of God or do you believe traditions of men? He said, I want to talk to you very seriously about Christ returning to us and our gathering back to Him. Do you understand? That means the, the consummation 
and what we all look forward to is gathering back to Christ. Well, how does it happen? Verse 2, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us. Don't let that first letter to the Thessalonians deceive you or fool you as that the day of Christ is at hand. What he's going to do, he's going to say there's some things that have got to take place first. Don't let some preacher, don't let some spirit or anyone else deceive you about us getting back together with Christ except what? Three, let no man deceive you by any means for that day shall not come. I repeat, shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. There is no way on earth, Paul is saying, that Christ will return until after, I repeat, after falling away is the apostasy, okay? The great apostasy. People changing their religion, professed religion, instantly in one day. Well, what is he talking about? The son of perdition is going to be kicked from heaven and he's coming to this earth. And the falling away is when they accept him as Christ and he's Antichrist. He's instead of Christ. You'll have a few freaks that will tell you the Antichrist isn't coming. Blow them off, okay? They're worthless. The word makes it very clear. There is no way. As Christ said in Mark 13, the Antichrist shall come first. That's, who is the son of perdition? You, you, there's not a multiple choice. Let me explain the word uh, perdition, a palier. It means uh, the one who has already been promised to perish. Well, we haven't even had judgment day yet. How could, how could anyone be sentenced to perish? Oh, there has been a judgment day for one. And if you're familiar, as we learned in 1 Thessalonians, you have no reason that he tell us why? Because you've read it in Ezekiel chapter 28. Satan has already been condemned to die. He is the only one by name that has been sentenced to perdition. That means to hell, so to speak. Only one. So there's no, you don't need a multiple choice. Um, and he will, that man of sin will be revealed, the son of perdition. Revealed where? Well, God is real good to you. He's going to show you exactly where he will be revealed at geographically. Verse 4, who, the man of sin, Satan, the son of the, the devil, the false Christ, the Antichrist, Lucifer, whatever, he, all those names fit him, whichever you wish to call him. Verse 4, who opposeth, and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So where is God's temple? Jerusalem. He will return to this earth, Satan will, and he will set up office as the return savior now that's why that the flyaway doctrine can be very dangerous. You don't, wanna, you don't want to hop in the sack with the false Messiah at his great wedding. This is why Jesus would say in Mark 13, woe to those that are with child when I return. Why? He is the husband and he expects a virgin bride spiritually. I don't know how Paul could make it any simpler that Christ is concerning our gathering back to Christ and Christ coming back to us, that it's not going to happen until after the son of perdition lands in Jerusalem claiming to be Messiah, even above Almighty God. He will be performing miracles in the sight of man, as it is written in Revelation 13, that would deceive, if it were possible, even the elect. That's how good he is, friend. 
Now continuing on, verse 5. Remember ye not that when I was with you, I told you these things. While we were sitting around at night, I made this all very clear. Verse 6. And now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. You know who his children are. You, you know who he follows. You know what his MO is, his method of operation. And you know where to look. Why, why? Well, how do I know where to look? He just told you. He just told you. Sitting in the temple of God. Showing the world that he is God. Pretending to be God. This is what Isaiah 14 is about. When he sits on the north side of that temple. Claiming to be God. This isn't the first time that you've been warned about this. Verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Boy, does it. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Now, would-be scholars have sawed at this, hammered at it, confused it, beat it, simply by not sticking to the principles of the language that it's translated from. Who letteth to let. What is that? That is a transitive verb. Meaning to let, he who letteth and will let, there's nobody named there. And who is it? Who is the other part? That's why it's a transitive verb. You have to go back to four, verse four, to understand who it's talking about. Who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God. It's talking about Satan. Well, who is it that's holding Satan? That's letting him? Who is it that's going to let him out? Better said, kick him out. Well, I feel led to real quickly turn over to Revelation chapter 12, verse uh, 7, when I get there and read to you verse 7. And there was a war in heaven. That's where Satan is now. You understand that. Christ said, get behind me. And Michael holds him there. His evil spirit can walk the earth, but he de facto is helped prisoner there, the one that lets. Who is the one that lets? Michael. And his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, all of his names, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him to start chasing women again the way they did in Genesis chapter 6. It's going to happen. Okay. Why, then God continues and uses each one of Satan's names separately down to the dragon chasing God's elect in the last generation. He's the one that is cast out. And he is coming. He's the false Christ. He will establish and take over the world, so to speak. Why? Well, he is supernatural. He will not have any trouble whatsoever deceiving the world. What did we read in St. John there in chapter 2, verse 18, somewhere along in there? The anti, there are antichrists here now, but the antichrist, the instead of Jesus, instead of Messiah, shall come, not maybe. He comes on the toe of Michael's boot. Okay, you got it? Now, a lot of people will uh, work the Holy Spirit in here. The Holy Spirit has no article. And then the worst leaders of all are those that say, well, the church is the one that keeps Satan away. Baloney. You show me a church that has power over Satan in this generation and we'll give them a golden star. the ignorance that it prevails concerning the chronological order of events in this nation and the world is not something that the majority should marvel about by trying to stick to church or so there's no article how how can you handle the greek that recklessly 
You know, to handle the Word of God that recklessly is a good way to be on the opposite side and worshiping the devil, thinking you're going to fly away. He's going to try to load his bus up. Are you going to get on board or do you know better? Verse 8, um, verse 8 reads, And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, what? His word. Our word of Christ from even our mouth has power over Satan and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. That's the second coming. The, the second advent of Christ return. He will destroy Satan at that time. Why? Michael's going to throw him back in the abyss and he's going to stay there for the Lord's day, which is a thousand years. Verse nine, even him, whose coming is after the working of Satan, the role of Antichrist, same person though, with all power and signs and lying wonders. Oh, he, hey, listen, he can snap his fingers and make lightning come from heaven. You want to invite him to your church and let him show off to the congregation his wonders to perform? Or are you going to warn your church about his coming before he gets here? So that's prophecy, my friend, taught from the prophecy of Almighty God to forewarn the people of this world. 10. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, that's those that go to hell, become, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. The love of the truth is so good. Christ died on the cross to bring in salvation and that you should be true to him and be, remain a spiritual virgin until the true Christ comes back to destroy Satan and his fallen angels, to be a witness, to be one of his elect. Can you cut it? Or are you listening to traditions of men? Verse 11, And for this cause God shall send them Strong delusion. God is going to do it. God shall send them strong delusion that they shall believe a lie. There are some that God, as it is written in Romans chapter 11, has already sent the spirit of slumber upon. They're sleeping. Well, what does that mean? They're people of the night. They're asleep. They're not watching. If you, don't, if you don't receive God when he makes it very clear to you, then he will help you confuse yourself. Well, that doesn't sound hardly fair. Well, if you understood the millennium, it's very fair because some don't have the courage to stand against the false Christ. The sin and ignorance is not so bad, and when we get through straightening them out by taking the air out of them in the millennium and dressing them down, teaching them a little discipline, they might get to be pretty good Christians. I don't know. We'll find out. Verse, it don't, if you don't understand that, put it on the shelf, okay? Verse 12, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth. Do you believe the truth or do you listen to the traditions of men? You want to fly away when Christ is coming here and you have to stand against the false Christ first? Hey, get on his bus, friend, if that's where you want to go. It's headed straight for hell. But had pleasure in unrighteousness, a wedding out of season. Verse 13, but we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God has from the beginning chosen you. That's election to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief in the truth, one that loves that truth, that seeks it, that searches it, that is a hunter of it. Uh, verse 14, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ takes care of his own, okay? Therefore, brethren, stand fast, and hold the traditions which ye have been taught from what? From God's word, not traditions of men that make void the word of God. Whether by word or by epistle, you stand. You put the gospel armor on and in place and stand against the fiery darts of Satan. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, 
which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, through unmerited favor. Some of us live a life that uh, we don't deserve it, but he gives it. Comfort your hearts. Let the Holy Comforter comfort you and establish you in every good word, every good word and work. Well, what's a good word and work? God's word and God's work. Not man's, not man's traditions, not a bunch of false prophets teaching falsely. I heard from God today. Well, you better make sure that if anyone has a message from God that is counter to the Word of God, they're liars. It's that simple. So that's the reason that the flyaway doctrine can be quite dangerous. Because I don't know how anyone that was searching for truth could misunderstand this second chapter about Christ returning to us and our gathering back to Christ, that it's not going to happen until after the false one comes first and we must stand against him. As Jesus taught us in, in uh, Mark chapter 13 and Matthew 24, you will be delivered up before him possibly and you're not to premeditate what you will say beforehand, but you will speak that that the Holy Spirit gives you to speak at that time, at that moment, that the real truth has an opportunity to go around the world even in that hour. What, you know, what a fantastic time to live. Don't throw it away by, by men pleasers. Stick to God's Word and thank Him for that truth. All right. And that answers that question. Let's answer another question that is probably most often asked. What should I do to a brother that has abused me, stolen from me, robbed from me, mistreated me, won't listen to me, hates God? What should I do about it? Do I have to, as a Christian, gravel to them? Well, let's find out. Stay in this second chapter of Thessalonians. Skip to the third chapter, verse 6. Chapter 3, verse 6, 2 Thessalonians. You see, the Word foretells us all things. All you have to do is read it and absorb it. Verse 6, and it reads, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw, I repeat, withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, that means lazily, not caring, fit for nothing, and not after the tradition which he received of us. That's to say, what tradition did he receive? They did hard work. Paul worked for, he didn't take a salary for himself. He, he worked hard. Verse 7, for yourselves know how ye ought to follow us. Imitate what we do. For we behaved not ourselves disorderly among you. We didn't loaf around. Verse 8. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day that we might not be chargeable to any, any of you, that, that we wouldn't be an expense to you. Paul was a tent maker. And when, when he was not teaching, he was earning his way. Okay? Verse 9. Not because we have not power. That's to say, we have the right. A servant is worthy of his hire. Got it? But to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. Imitate us. Verse 10. What do you do with somebody that won't work and they just... They're, uh, here they are already 32, and they're my little child, but uh, they won't go out and get a job, and they just sit at my table. What are you supposed to do? Verse 10, For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. It's just the way it is. If a man won't work, and, he, and he's physically able, this has nothing to do with the handicap. If a man or woman is physically able 
to go out and work, don't feed them. Don't be an enabler. Now, th this isn't saying somebody that's down on their luck and they drop by and you're trying to give them a leg up on something to help them out for a little bit, you know, but there's no sin in being uh, down and out. You know, I suppose that sometimes in our lives, all of us at one time or the other, maybe as younger, we're down and out. Well, God will help pick you up, all right? But if, it's, if somebody deliberately is mooching off of you, if you allow it, even if it's your own child, you become an enabler to the person's habits, bad habits. Don't let them eat. Well, my goodness, they would starve. Uh-uh. You know, God created these bodies pretty well, and as I know all of you have heard me say it, that there's a little microchip between your backbone and your belly button and when they get too close together from starvation, it sends a message back up that central nervous system and says, go to work for heaven's sakes and feed me. All right. Nobody, when people get hungry enough, they're going to find something to do. It may be polishing shoes. No telling what it would be. But um, they're going to work. Okay. Well, that's, that is hard. Yes, it is. T uh, tough love is hard. It is especially if it's one of your own. But they have to grow, my friend, and that is the true love of all loves, is to love someone enough to let them know how bad they are if they're bad. Verse 11, For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, lazy in the Greek, working not at all but are busybodies, gossipers, can't do anything to help God or God's church but gossip about anybody that does. You know, Satan's really got them a good servant when they can get somebody going like that. You know, get a life. Anybody that has nothing, has time to gossip is lazy and no good. Okay, they're, they're um, busybodies. God's not happy with them. What are their chances of making heaven? Well, uh, I would think you'd know it's pretty low. Verse 12. Now, them, that's, them that are such, we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ, this is straight from the Lord Jesus Christ, that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. That means get out there and hump it. Okay. Again, I want to make sure this is not concerning handicap. Verse 13, But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. You, you, you don't be weary in doing what is right. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. In other words, a lot of people think they have to let people run over them and as a good Christian, they have to put up with it. He says, kick them out. Don't enable them. That's after they've had opportunity after opportunity. Don't have anything to do with them. Uh, socially, as far as feeding them or sleeping them, uh, providing shelter is what I'm saying, or what. Hey, they're on their own. That's love. That's true love. They need it. Verse 15, yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. I mean, come down on him hard. Now, that's how you are to handle a brother. That, you know what a brother is? You know, in God's word, you have brothers and neighbors. That's two separate categories. A brother is one born of the womb of Israel, and a neighbor is one that is that of Israel by adoption. Now, I will say no more about that other than that one statement. That means really your own kinsman as brother. It applies. You don't grovel to anyone. You're a child of God. Act like it and expect people to, to appreciate your goodness with thanksgiving, for it is also from the Lord Jesus Christ. But don't let don't let lazy bums take advantage of you and never be an enabler to someone's bad habits. Okay? God doesn't appreciate it. So, there is the answer. What, how do you handle a family member or friend that will not work? Does a Christian 
uh, feel sorry for them and let them in every time. No. You kick them out. Let them work on their own. Now, don't worry. They'll do fine. They may even grow up. So there's that question. Hey, we're going to do this again in the next broadcast. Don't miss it. Stand by a minute. Listen, won't you please? The book of Deuteronomy. The law was given as our schoolmaster. Have you been to school on God's Word? Certainly one way to go there is to study the book of Deuteronomy. Probably the most, the most exciting thing that Deuteronomy has to offer for you is that great song of Moses that those that overcome the false Messiah in the end generation will be singing. The law itself being the schoolmaster that keeps us out of trouble in these flesh bodies. Again, an education in taming that part of you that oftentimes needs taming through the old schoolmaster that great book, Deuteronomy, the law, and its set ways of keeping you from harm's way even in this generation. You're going to enjoy it. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves and you have a question, you share it. Won't you do that, please? Uh, please never ask a question about a particular um, teacher, preacher, person, uh, religion, or organization. Let's don't judge people. Let's teach the Word. Let the chips fall wherever they may. God's Word is so very good to align us with this earth age in spirit whereby we can still overcome and even have peace here on earth within our own mind. Peace of mind is a precious thing. You'll never find it anywhere except in our Father's Word. All right, those of you that listen by short wave, it's always a pleasure hearing from you. Your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. You got a prayer request, do away with the number and the address. You know why? God knows what you're thinking. That's how easy it is for you to communicate with Him. Do you know where Christ is? He's right at his right hand, sitting right at his right hand. He's there for you. Ask it in his name always, but ask the Father the petition. Father, around the globe we come, we ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father, touch in Yeshua's precious name. Amen. Okay, and John from Montana. Uh, question. If women are the stronger of the two sexes, then why were the 12 disciples men? My next question is if, well, let's, we'll, we'll answer that one. You know, uh, why I say that, uh, you know, people will say, well, all souls were in heaven and some here are female and some are male. How did, the, I'm asked that question a lot. Why did God decide uh, which would be male and which would be female? Well, I tell you what, I, I would like to, most men could not handle what women go through, okay, starting with childbirth. You know, if it wasn't for a woman, you wouldn't even be here. And your mother went through a great deal of pain. I, I don't know too many men that if it was left up to them, they'd say, I ain't having no children, okay, if it were, but they, they, they're, they're tough people. Um, let's see, how does it go? A man's, uh, I, I'm, it slipped my mind now. Um, patience is a virtue, possess it if you can, seldom found in women and never found in men. Okay, but a, a man will go out and do eight hours work and come in, oh lordy, and here, uh, this woman has diapered six kids, done all the laundry, went grocery shopping, took half of them to school and back again and then to the ball game. He comes in in eight hours and says, Honey, bring me a beer. I'm wore out. Now, that woman has got to work on until almost, you know, bedtime. And then he might still be after. You know, you don't know. And then uh, do you think a man could handle that? You know, God picked the toughest. 
The, being the disciple maybe wasn't the hardest thing in the world. Being a wife to some of these men in this generation might be a lot tougher. Am I teasing? Well, you figure it out. My next question, if the Neanderthal man does or does not exist, can our scientific people perform a DNA test for proof? If they didn't exist, where in the world would they get the DNA to, to find out scientifically if they existed or not? The only thing that was ever found was a piece of jaw, okay? And, and you know what they did? They, people are real good at that. To put that jaw there and then put the rest of it together to match the jaw and had the figure of the head of this Neanderthal man. And do you know what it looked like? An ape. Well, I wonder how come that thing looked like an ape. Because it was an ape, okay? I mean, it's, um, yesterday I used the term, you wouldn't have to be a rocket scientist to, to uh, understand that. And you know, in the congregation here at Broadcast, I had a rocket scientist. He was very um, well used in the moon shots uh, at first, Apollo, the Apollo program. And he said, you make me a little uncomfortable when you use that terminology, and I really hang on to understand. So anyway, Shirley from Texas, while watching your, in other words, there was no Neanderthal man. God created us in his image, and we still look the same way, okay? Hey, you might say, well, they sure took some pictures of some woolly characters. Well, hey. I can take you to places right today and we can snap some pictures and I can show you some pretty bad looking woolly characters, all right? I mean, maybe all you're going to see is two peep holes. Sure, they look like Neanderthals, you know? Uh, look at Saddam Hussein when they pulled him out of the pit. Is this the man that deceived the world? Um, you saw two peep holes. You did see that. Shirley from Texas. While watching your teaching programs this morning, a question came to my mind. When you, when you uh, commented on a third of the angels followed Satan, secure the something during the question time, my question is, since you know a third followed, how many angels are there? Well, we know that about half the people that have been since Adam are living today. And how many people are there today? Six billion. Well, then if you doubled six billion, you get 12, one of God's precious numbers, don't we? Paul from Nevada. If there is no reproduction in heaven, how could the fallen angels have reproductive organs or man's to impregnate woman? Well, who was Adam made in the image of? God and the angels, Elohim. Um, you're, you're talking about uh, the earth age that is coming. It's a different body. When people resurrect it for the eternity, it's a different body than we have today, angelic or human being, all right? And um, that's just, and it is different even than it is in the first earth age. That was a different body. Basically shaped the same. DNA, probably pretty much the same. That's probably your same old DNA all the way through. But as it is written in Jeremiah, let me think for a moment, chapter 4, along about verse uh, 20, after verse 18, 20, 22, 23, God destroyed all men on earth to pull them back out from that uh, first earth age. Okay? Uh, Leona from, uh, so three earth ages, three different bodies. Three heavenly ages, three different bodies. Leona from Indiana. Do women have to wear dresses in church or can she wear pants? They say women are not to talk in church. Is it all right for them to say amen? Of course it is. Well, the, you know, many figures of speech get kind of twisted in translation and with understanding. What it means is women get a bad rap on this. It means don't chatter. I, I know an old boy that's worse than any woman I've ever seen about chattering. He's a ratchet jaw. All he does is yeah, 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 and never says anything. It amounts to a hill of beans. We even call him ratchet jaw. Not, I mean, he's not with us anymore, thank God. But uh, uh, 
don't chatter in church. I won't allow anybody to, all right? Now, concerning women wearing dresses, you, you were speaking of the great book of Deuteronomy where it says a woman should never wear men's clothing. Well, what did men, what kind of clothing did men wear during Deuteronomy 22 and 23? They wore skirts. Does that mean, or, or dresses if you wish. This is why when they girded themselves up, they took their girt and run it down between their legs and pulled their little skirts up, whereby their legs were free and they could do battle. So you see, what it means is a woman should never uh, take the, a man's part in a sexual act. That's what it means, okay? Unfortunately, it kind of gets lost in the translation down to something like clothing. Isn't that kind of sad? Maxine from Utah. Does the Antichrist come before or after the Lord? Boy, Maxine, I hope you were listening to the, to the first teaching of this. Does the Antichrist come before or after the Lord? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. No way will I, Christ return back to us until after the son of perdition is revealed. So that your question was answered today. Louise from Georgia. I want to know if a child that is handicapped mentally is baptized with oil in a church and then dies, will he still go to heaven? Whether he was baptized or anointed, either one. A child is innocent and always goes to heaven, okay? A child that is at, not at the age of accountability is always innocent. There are some souls that are just too good for this world, and God brings them home. I really feel that. Joan from Michigan. I don't understand how Jesus and Passover are the same thing. Would you please explain? We really appreciate your program. Well, thank you, Joan. What happened at Passover? If you took the blood of the lamb and put it on the doorpost, the death angel had to pass over. Well, who is the lamb slain? That's Christ, Christ's blood. And if you, as it is, and where is it written that Christ is our Passover? Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. And it is Christ's blood, the holy sacrament. It is Christ's blood shed on that cross that we are under today. In other words, he becomes our Passover lamb. And for one and all times, Hebrews chapter 10 will help you. Lo, I come in the volume of the book that he became our Passover because when we are in him, the death angels got to keep passing over and over and over as far as spiritually speaking that to have any influence upon us. Christ protects us. That's why he's our Passover. He makes that that is evil pass over us. Tom from Texas. How did Cain's offspring, the Kenites, survive Noah's flood? Well, you know they did because they were mentioned in several times in the Bible. Then go back and read chapter 6 of the great book of Genesis. And what, what did God tell Noah to take aboard that ark? He told him to take the eight Adamites that he knew that were not intermixed with those fallen angels. But he said take two of every flesh, that means of every race, aboard that ark, and they were, and so it is. You see them today. That's how they survived the flood. Marcia from Wisconsin. You teach Mark 13 now being aired. My question is, if our family will be the ones who turn us over to death, Satan, will they be forgiven in the millennium? This really scares me. Well, don't let it. In the millennium, you have a chance to help them as it is written in Ezekiel 44, that if you see a mother, brother, father, sister, brother in trouble, you can go to them and uh, help correct them as one of God's elect. Um, and so that, don't, don't let it frighten you. Be glad that God has chosen you to see the truth and to be able in a position where you can help your family, even if one should do that. The, you, you can perhaps bring them out of the fire, not, not literally. You can perhaps change their mind spiritually in the millennium. You will have that ability. I'll, uh, Olivia from Wisconsin. 
I have studied with you for almost 10 years now, but have never wrote in because by writing my question usually got answered. But now I need your help. A couple of months ago, a mis I miscarried our fourth child. I am having a hard time getting over it, even with the can-do attitude. Well, well hun, like I said, there are some children that are just too good for this earth age. Don't you worry about it. Uh, things happen. And I really believe that uh, this earth is just too cruel for that entity. So just thank God for even sharing the beginning with you. All right. And, and, and don't put yourself on any guilt trip. And yes, that entity will know you and know how much you love them. Don't, don't grieve, dear child, please. Let know that our Father is in control. And there are some souls that are just too good for what's happening now. Al from Florida. I'm an associate minister of a church and I would like for you to redefine your position on baptism. I know that some baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, others in Jesus' name. What is your position on this? Well, my position is, is they're saying the same thing. If you baptize in Jesus' name only, what is Jesus? Translate it. Where did it come from? It came from the word Yeshua, which is to say Yahweh, that's God, Savior, that's the Son. And as it is written in, in uh, John chapter 14, where those two are, their spirit is there. That's the Holy Spirit. So you're, it, it's somatic. It's... Wor it's um, uh, not understanding language, I suppose, that causes some people to even split religion over ignorance. And it's, it's sad. It's a shame. I use, I, I baptize in the name of Yahweh, Yeshua, and the Holy Ruach. Okay. So uh, that's what I baptize in. Uh, my people expect it. Sharon, from the, those are the sacred names of our Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Sharon from Pennsylvania, a man stopped out in front of my car and I hit him. He later died. Is this murder? I have been so disturbed about this. No, it's an accident. Murder is where you premeditate taking a life. You plan it. Okay? And uh, what happened to you was certainly not... I want you to make a note of Deuteronomy chapter 19. Your part would be the part that you went out with a neighbor to cut wood, okay? And the axe flew off the handle when you were cutting wood and hit the neighbor. That's called an accident. So uh, forgive, you're not forgiving yourself. And yes, that's bad. But God understands and stuff happens. Things happen. So mature from it and, uh, and serve God. You're doing good, okay? John, it is not murder. For, uh, forgive yourself now in Jesus' name. John from Oregon. If one day with the Lord is as a thousand years with man, does that mean that it took God 7,000 years in our time to create this earth age? Well, a lot of people think it did. You know, we have an interesting thing that um, when, when we find uh, like uh, the frozen animals in Alaska and in, in under the tundra that were frozen instantly, there was one mammoth frozen with uh, buttercup still in their mouth. And, and we find these still in Alaska. And when you carbon test it, guess what? 14,000 years. So that's when the katabo happened, that an instant freeze came over the earth. So um, we're, let's see, we're 6,000 here, and the katabo, if it took... A thousand years for each day of um, forming the earth, that'd be about 13, 14,000 years. So uh, the science itself aligns, and you need to think about it, all right? Uh, Sue from Tennessee, where can I find a companion Bible? Um, we have them in our library. They're a, fan, they're a good study Bible because they outline the subject. Uh, Linda from California. My question is, I believe, in second, I believe in 2 Timothy, it is written that women should not braid their hair. Can you please explain this for me? 
It simply meant at that time there was a custom that harlots did their hair in a certain way. What it meant is, is don't dress like a, har a harlot. And that's it. Do things in moderation. Okay, that's, that's all. Judy from North Carolina. Is there anywhere in the Bible that confirms or disallows that we choose our parents, the people that we're born to? I really need to know, please, or does God choose? God does the choosing. Okay, we don't have anything to do with that. Richard from Pennsylvania. Please explain Matthew 24, verses 40 and 41. You did explain it one time, and we thought we understood, but then someone else said different. Now we are confused. Well, there's um, one reason that you want to always stick to God's Word. What is the subject of Matthew 24? The return of Christ. Who comes first? Who is taken first? Well, the Antichrist comes first. The first one taken from the field is taken by Satan. I mean, that, that is common sense, okay? Jesus didn't say, I'm going to come down there and take some of them up here. No, that's not the way it happens. He's gathering back together with us here, okay? Stick to the Word. Don't listen to this man or any other man to override the Word of God. I'm out of time. Hey, you know what? I love you all a lot because you enjoy studying our Father's Word in more depth. Most important, though, God loves you for it. Do you know something? It makes his day when you let him know you love him. Why? You're his child. It really makes his day. And when you make his day, he's going to make yours. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, bless God. He will always bless you. But one thing most important, that's this. Put a little time aside each day. Stay in his word. Every day in His Word is a good day, even when there's trouble. You know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, He is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.